Well, I think we're going to take questions. Responses? Abuse? <laughs> oh, because yeah, I would be abused. Yeah. <laughs> um, two questions. I'll ask them quickly. Would you agree that the concept of legacy is to recognize both the positive and negatives in the life and career of the individual for the sake of learning from them both? Yeah, actually, I would. Okay. And good, good quote. Second question is similar. <clears throat> Um, as an institution of higher learning, is it not true that we are to teach and learn from our history, regardless of the good, bad, and ugly, in spite of how, comfort how uncomfortable it may make us within our modern context? Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Other responses, don't be shy. <laughs> yeah? This is an informational question that's beyond the scope of your talk. Do, do we know what the decision-making process was about naming the library after Sean? I don't know. Yes. Do. Oh, okay, thank you. <laughs> I do. Uh, the, uh, the, the library was built and, and it was completed in 1967. And uh, the, the year before that, I'm not sure the exact time, but the year before that, um, the faculty unanimously decided after, after a whole lot of discussion, actually, that the library ought to be named after Philip Schaff as a, to honor his the ecumenical, you know, and several of the kinds of things that he has been mentioned. Um, that that's the there isn't any record in the in the faculty minutes. It just says the faculty unanimously voted <laughs> to do this. I mean that that's all I know. But that's that's what the record says. It, it makes sense in context because in the eighteen sixties in the nineteen sixties, uh, ecumenism, especially yeah. Protestant Catholic ecumenism, was much on everyone's minds. And Schaff in those days was remembered primarily as the pioneer that kind of expansive Christian ecumenism that, in, that embraced Orthodox and Catholics. Yeah, a, couple of, a couple of the faculty who were here in the 60s who were my teachers were, were the first Protestants to have um, uh, a scholarly dialogue with Roman Catholic scholars. Mm -hmm. and, and the reason that I asked that, Lee, was not to detract from your really helpful work. But the, one of the things we've learned about the monuments, um, which is the yeah. contemporary context in which some of this have come, is that it's both the legacy of the person and the politics of the construction of their memory. So, I mean, we know in the case of the Southern monuments, a lot of them, they were put in for races purposes long after the event. So I, I was curious about that. Thank you. And be, before Martin Marty's uh, brief remarks in the 18th, in, in the 1970s, I don't think anybody knew what Schaff's views of race were. Because nobody asked. Yeah. Right. Yeah. But, but that means that wasn't a factor in the naming of the library. Explicitly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Other folk? Don't be shy. I, yeah. I'm going to be a picky, make a, um, correct something that you said, because I, you, you mistakenly said 1856, he went to Hampton. Institute. Oh, oh, yeah, no, 76. Oh, I'm sorry, I said 56. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah, I assure you that. Yeah. Somewhat after the same. Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and, and found this um, education for black students, and that he was very glad to see. Yeah, and that's, you know, to, to our ears, that still sounds really paternalistic yeah. and, and condescending, and, and, and it was. Um, 
but in its context, it was, it was fairly revolutionary. But again, I'm, I'm, again, I'm not trying to justify him because he did use racial stereotypes. Um, he always assumed till the day he died that the culture of Britain, Germany, Scandinavia, the United States, what the Anglo United States was the crowning achievement of world history, and it just needed to be spiced up a little with some contributions from other cultures. Right. Yeah. Um, again, this doesn't have to do with Philip Shack directly, but one of the sentiments that I was hearing that people had was um, our community read the cross and the lynching tree by James Cone, and James Cone cited Philip Sheff as being one of those um, thinkers who justified um, a position that other people used to justify lynching. And yeah. so just kind of adding another layer on top of it, I think that, that um, that's the, shock, the most shocking thing. Yeah, well, um, yeah. Things. Well, a couple things about that. Uh, Cohn didn't really read Schaff. He got that quote from Martin Marty, which was the same quote that Martin Marty used. And in, in what Schaff was talking about there was not race at all. It was culture. And it was a statement of North European Protestant cultural superiority. Um, but to, and uh, uh, certainly that general sensibility did play into racism. For sure. Uh, however, I'm not sure that Schaff was the right person to pick as a poster child for that. The things Nevin said were worse, and just about everybody else here, including things said by Abraham Lincoln and Ralph Waldo Emerson, and even Henry David Thoreau, uh, Harry Beecher Stowe herself. Um, they all believed in. Uh, white, well, not white, because it wasn't racial, but in North European cultural superiority. That, that was just a given for almost every, everybody who was descended from North Europeans. In the, and I suspect that that lasted well into the 1960s. So, so one of the, I think the learnings from history about the ugliness of history is that some of the things that the opinions that we find reprehensible um, weren't restricted to single individuals or single parties, but were widespread, uh, just sort of the cultural framework with which people operated. Yeah. Um, and perhaps it was said in some other formats and I missed it, but I'm, I'm sort of confused about this conversation. I'm trying to figure out, like, so we got the education about who he is. Yeah. What are we asked to do with that? Like, what's the end game? What's the purpose? What's the, yeah, I'm trying to figure out what drove this conversation. Good question. Um, who on the committee wants to answer it? <laughs> Since I'm actually not on that committee. I, I guess I will. So I'm chair of the community task force. Uh, we are a task force that was appointed by President Litch uh, to research uh, and get feedback from current students uh, relating to a student concern that was received. Uh, was the country receiving? Oh. It's been a year and a half ago. 2017. In the spring of 2017, uh, was when this concern was raised. Uh, so, our work actually began. Um, we were constituted, uh, came about in uh, November. Uh, so we and we are um, we were commissioned. I guess that's the right word for a year's uh, study. Uh, so our work is actually coming to a conclusion. Um, 
we are expected to give President Lynch some recommendations, uh, but we need to hear from you all uh, before we can make those recommendations. Uh, so at, after these uh, lecture events, there's an identical, somewhat identical one, different people, same time or same place, um, tomorrow afternoon. Um, we've got the recordings. These are gonna be uh, shared online and also shared with alums at that point as well. Um, we um, have some feedback forms, so that's what you'll be getting at the, at the conclusion. We'll go ahead and start passing this around. This is a clipboard. We want to know uh, that you came today. We'll be asking you on this form if you would prefer to give your feedback to one of us in a one-on-one -on -one session. And so just circle yes or no. We can schedule those with you at your convenience. We have three questions that we want to ask you, um, or three substantive questions. We're also just collecting some general demographic data as well, so that we get a sense of who all is participating in this. How long do you anticipate these feedback sessions would take? 10 minutes, Ten, maybe 15. 10, maybe 15 minutes. It depends on how, how much you give us for each of these three questions, right? Um, the online form is exactly identical. So if you, even if you look, just say no on this form and look at the online form and decide, you know, I really would rather have a conversation with someone, uh, reach out to John Paredes. He's the one that is coordinating, uh, scheduling uh, those who are requesting the one-on-one -on -one sessions with those of us on the committee who are conducting those sessions. Um, does that answer your question? Do you have any other questions yeah, about our work? So, um, so, so is the thinking that perhaps having his name on this building is offensive to someone, and if it is, there's a discussion about changing a name. I'm trying to figure out where we're going with this, what the purpose of it is. So the content of this student's concern, I don't, we decided not to share the whole long thing. Um, but yes, the student concern that we started with was the name on this building is somewhat offensive and has an impact, a negative impact on students who attend the seminary. Can I go actually a little bit? Absolutely, please do. So the original, and I, I do have a question for you sure. uh, after that, but the original um, comment that came uh, to the Diversity and Educational Life Committee in 2017 was really one that asked the question of, given that Shock's name is on the library and given that James Cone explicitly does call him out as being an example of the kind of theology that has driven lynching and white supremacy in the United States. How does the seminary and how do the, the seminary community kind of integrate those two? How do we think about that? What does that mean, uh, especially to students of color here? And so that conversation has been ongoing for the past two years. And part of the charge we were given as a task force was to find out, to talk to people and find out what does that mean to our community. So part of our charge is literally to start talking about some of these issues and engaging with them as a, a collective body. Does that help? Yes. Okay. Um, and my question is, um, from Schaff's writing, it's pretty clear that um, although he considered his own view to be entirely rational, and it, it seemed that it was very much rooted in his cultural history. I mean, he, he made primarily his, the culture that produced him as being the best culture. Uh, so there's a sense there that he's somewhat blinded by personal pride, by... Um, the limitations of having grown up in a given context that formed him in a certain way. And so my, my question is, given that Schaff was blinded in that way around these issues and the way he discussed them, what's the likelihood that in the modern context we are also blinded by a similar 
uh, inability to see past our own historical context? Yeah, good, good question. Um, yeah, he certainly was a product of his culture, um, which he began to identify loosely as North European Protestant rather than specifically German. Uh, and he never reneged on the notion that that was the, uh, the cutting edge of Western civilization and world history, for that matter. Um, and so there is a question of um, how does that fly in our contemporary context? Um, would he even remembering Schaff in any way whatsoever uh, contribute to uh, feelings of cultural superiority that are that are rampant, um, in fact, scarily rampant? Um, wasn't one of Trump's um, press people uh, said that the Statue of Liberty when it said, you know, "Give us your your poor," etc was referring only to Europeans. <laughs> um, yeah, that's, uh, that, that, that's frightening. Um, and again, again I, I don't want to sound like I'm defending Schaff, but it would have been hard pressed to find anybody in the late 19th century, mid 19th century, probably up through the 1950s, any white Protestant in the United States who would think anything different. So is that kind of like a like the world is flat kind of idea uh, that you know of course there's you know uh, sea monsters at the edge of the world kind of mentality um, you know it's kind of given yeah it was it, it, it was uh, just assumed to be a uh, the foundational cultural belief you know, we, we hopefully I think many of us have grown out of that. But it was for whites in the U.S., or, or at least um, whites who weren't Irish, Italian, or Polish. Uh, it was it was pretty universal. Yeah, I actually have a question for the task force. If that's okay, is this the only? Are are these lectures the only public forum? That the task force is organizing because Lee, I really appreciate your your comments, but to me, that's not really the question. Is who Schaff was? It's about sh how we honor Schaff in the moment. So I'm I'm curious. Is is this the end of the community conversation? Is that the end of that and that the only feedback will be through these one-on-one -on -one, or will there be other community events to address what in my view are the, the bigger issues? So based on our charge we have planned these events and if they're so a recommendation to hold additional events could certainly be a recommendation that comes from the task force. Um, our, we, our work concludes October 31st, so we're on a pretty limited timeline, uh, but certainly something that has been among our, you know, part of our conversations is that there is, there will be work, there is work to be done beyond what we've been tasked to do. Uh, in this one year um, period. And so part of our part of our thinking is that a recommendation for ongoing work uh, may come out of it. And, yeah. Um, so <clears throat> I heard you mention like other scholars that are part of like, the foundation of our school that you say is that things that may have been considered even more like directory plundering than Chop did. So like if this question about Chop kind of pulls that layer back, like are we able to I guess be critical of them as well in terms of like understanding like the origins or like the the culture of our institution or like how we how we uh, interpret their thinking too. Are we 
people to look at them with the same kind of lens if what they said is worse. Yeah, I mean, that, that's, that's a question to, to keep in mind. Um, since Nevin was worse, and uh, so are almost everybody up to the uh, 20th century, uh, what should we do about the legacies of all those other people? Uh, I, could, I could imagine two different arguments. One, to be consistent, you should take down or stop celebrating that legacy entirely of all of them. So get rid of the name of Nevin, Harder, Rauch, Rauch's on the, one of our stained glass windows in the chapel. Um, change all the names of the dormitories. Um, I can imagine that argument that if, for the sake of consistency, that's what should be done. I can also imagine an argument that I think, and I hate to put words in Julia's mouth. No, I don't. Uh, <laughs> uh, I'll, I'll let you know. <laughs> yeah, that it might be historically interesting that all those people were articulating even more extreme views about cultural superiority than Schaff was. Um, as a matter of historical fact right now, um, Largely because of Martin Marty's chance reference, Schaff has been singled out as a symbol of North European cultural supremacy. And given the reality that he has been so singled out, um, he, rather than the others, uh, should be the one whom, whose memory we treat more cautiously. So it's, for good or ill, Schaff has become the symbol of uh, uh, whether it's fair or not, uh, Schaff has become the symbol of uh, North European uh, supremacy. Uh, and given that, uh, the symbol should be treated very, very cautiously. Yeah, my last question. Sure. Um, so because Schaff does not write his immersive ideology being informed by the the black church, that level of the yeah. like that, uh, I guess that line of ecumenism that runs through his work. How do we engage Mercer Brick theology like through that African centered lens, or like where do we begin to do that as well? Like, us yeah. as like black students here studying yeah. Mercer theology, like yeah. where do we start to do that too? Yeah, that, that, that's a big lacuna. Uh, I mean, he should have. Uh, because his vision of, of Christianity was like it's, it's a big conversation, and the more voices, the better. And started out, yeah, big conversation means Lutherans and German reform. But, but no, it also means English speaking Calvinists. And oh, what do you know? It also means Catholics. Oh, and it means Eastern Orthodox. And it means Copts. And it means the Church of Thomas. And then he even opened it up and it means other religions Buddhism, Hinduism. And then he died. Mm -hmm. um, so, so his circle was expanding during his whole life. Um, but and he should have, he should have realized that the African-American voice is one that should be in the mix in, in regard to Christianity. That the, he should have paid attention to the black church. He knew it existed, he had first-hand experience of it. Um, it wasn't, they didn't know it was there. Um, he just took a look at African-American worship and said, oh yeah, this is kind of like Methodists. They're enthusiastic, and that's all he had to say about it. And, that, and that's tragic. Can the Mercersburg theology, with its focus on love, unity, and difference, um, can that be put in a fruitful discussion with, uh, with the Mercersburg theology? I, I think, oh yeah, it can, it can be. And Nathan Baxter has done it. So to, to conclude, because I know we're, I think we're going over time. Um, in this, uh, maybe I got in the weeds too much in this presentation, but my conclusions are kind of simple and you, and you can disagree with them. One is, uh, was Schaff pro-slavery? No. Uh, and there he moved from being a gradualist to an immediatist, immediate abolition. Was Schaff, did Schaff believe in white racial superiority? No. He believed in the equal potential of all races, although he did have some episodes where he sounded like um, he thought Africans were inferior, but he got over it. 
by the 1860s that had disappeared from his language, and he overtly affirmed the, uh, uh, ra the racial equality of everybody. Did he believe in, but was he a cultural imperialist, believing in the superiority of North European Protestant culture? And there, yeah, he was. Uh, but, he, but he was, but he became more and more generous to the contributions of other cultures as, uh, as time went on. Well, for, for example, he, he ended up saying that um, um, the, the synthesis of collectivity and individuality that had been forged in Northern Europe was perfect. That was great. It honors the collectivity, it also honors the individual. Great. Perfect synthesis. Um, but it could be a little bit spiced up with some Chinese diligence. Yeah, see, it, it, so we, we got the stew, we got the basic ingredients that's good, but we could take a little spice from some other cultures here and there. So it's, it's not a robust multiculturalism, but it's a baby step towards it. And in this context, um, maybe he was doing the best he could. Thank you very much. Thank you. Richardson has the flyers that have the um, the URL for the online feedback form, as well as John's email address if you decide you want to schedule a one-on-one -on -one session. Thank you very much for coming. Thanks. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.